listening to episode 25, chapter 3 of the Daily Growth Discipleship Podcast. I'm Josh Havens. And I'm Chris Lamberth. And we're on a journey to learn what it means to live a lifestyle of discipleship. We're glad you're joining us and hope that as you set aside this time for God, that he would help you grow today in the everyday moments of life. Winfield Bevins is an author, artist, and speaker whose passion is to help others connect to the roots of the Christian faith for discipleship and mission. He's the director of church planting at Asbury Theological Seminary, and he frequently speaks at conferences on a variety of topics and is a regular adjunct professor at several seminaries. Having grown up in a free church background, Winfield eventually found his spiritual home in the Anglican tradition, but freely draws from wisdom from all church traditions. Having authored several books, his writings explore the convergence of liturgy, prayer, and mission. His latest book, Ever Ancient, Ever New, examines young adults who have embraced Christian liturgy and how it has impacted their lives. As an artist, Winfield is dedicated to connecting the church and the arts community. He is a visual artist who enjoys painting iconography, landscapes, and portraits. Over the past decade, he has helped start numerous arts initiatives, including a nonprofit art gallery and studio and an arts program in North Carolina. Why are young people across the United States suddenly turning to liturgical worship? What is it about liturgy that appeals to them so much? What unspoken need is being met? In today's chapter, Winfield discusses who liturgy is for and how those of us from a non-liturgical tradition can explore this style of worship for the first time. Who do you think should be looking into liturgical worship? Like, is it for everyone, or do you think it's a style of worship for a particular kind of person? That's a good question. Yeah, I, I think it—let me say this. I think it can be for everyone. Obviously, it's not for everyone. Um, you have people that have different preferences. Um, I think there's—I think a lot of it is there's misconceptions— around, again, this idea that people are suspicious of liturgy, oh, that's Catholic, or that's, you know, we're, we're free, we're, you know. Uh, I, I do think that there's a form, there's something formative that happens with saying the same prayers in partnership with free spontaneous prayers. So I'm not advocating with just following, every, you know, I, I guess what I'm saying is, that I think every church can have a more thoughtful, more theologically grounded and rooted worship experience. And I think we're going to be held accountable for that. I think a lot of the songs that contemporary churches sing, I think a lot of what's preached in a lot of contemporary churches is garbage. And I, I don't mean that in like a fundamentalist, like, or like I'm advocating some sort of, you know, oh, you have to... Uh, you know, follow this 100 percent. But again, there's so much of modern Christianity in North America is so pragmatic and is so driven by consumerism. And I think the reason the church is in such rapid decline in North America is we have given in to, we've sold our souls to modernity and to consumerism, and church leaders are going to be held accountable for that. And I think the future of Christianity will rise or fall on how we form the next generation of disciples. And I think young people are hungry for deep discipleship and a worship service that is thoughtful, contemplative, um, and, and forms them, that moves beyond just kind of the emotional or feel-good or pragmatic stuff, if that makes sense. I'd like to talk about uh, some of the specific liturgical practices that you talk about in the book a little bit, um, and, and specifically how those, because you have a great quote I'm going to read right here. There, you say, there are two primary reasons why young people are drawn to historic Christian faith, the certainty and the identity that's found within community. So I wanted to, ex to explore some of these uh, practices specifically and, and talk about how they instill this idea, especially identity. Identity is a really big key for us because 
Daily Growth Discipleship, we have five steps that we believe are on the path to creating a lifestyle of discipleship. And the first is this idea of identity. We have to know who we are in Christ first and foremost. Without without knowing that and having a clear understanding that we are beloved children of God, um, it's just you, you cannot move forward in your relationship with Him without ha- understanding that first. And so um, it, all of these practices that really help us explore that, I think are really helpful for creating a a rhythm and lifestyle of discipleship. Um, So maybe uh, what are some of the liturgical practices that you have found most helpful or that you have um, helped shape your identity the most? Yeah, I think, um, well, there's individual prayers and then there's the corporate worship of the church. So I think when I use liturgy, I, I kind of, I'm talking about the broad umbrella over both. And so, um, and again, this is for some people, it's probably hard to wrap their heads around that are not used to reciting creeds and understanding the importance of creeds. But creeds and catechesis are uh, – these are ancient statements of the faith. These are the earliest known statements of, of kind of a summation of the apostles' doctrine. And if you think of new churches, denominations, we're really quick to like create a new statement of faith. Like, hey, this is what separates us from the guys down the street. And I think a hunger, I have a chapter called Surprised by Orthodoxy, where I look at how young people actually are, a number of these young people are looking to the creeds because they want to affirm what the church has always believed, but they don't want to be bound by these secondary statements of faith that oftentimes are schismatic and kind of differentiate us from all the other Christians in the world, young people are actually saying, we do want to believe, but we don't want to believe stuff that's non-essential. And so what I think these ancient creeds, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, these are unitive statements that unify all Christians around the world in every Christian tradition. If you cannot affirm what's in the Apostles' and Nicene Creed, then you're not a Christian. Like those are the defining marks of orthodox historic Christianity. And and so on one level, the creeds play a role in the corporate worship of the church. And if you're affirming that, it it it, it gives us an identity that we are affirming what Christians have always we we're affirming what the martyrs affirmed. We're affirming what Augustine, Calvin, Luther Wesley, as we go throughout church history, the vast majority of all the saints that we claim, they affirm those creeds. So that's why I think that matters for identity. Um, Two, I think individual practices, the daily office of morning and evening prayer roots us in rhythms of ways in which Christians have worshipped patterns, words, thoughts, prayers, ways in which Christians have worshipped since the early Roman Greco times and have a foundation, even in the Old Testament, patterns of daily prayer. So just by praying those rhythms, we're standing with the prayers of the church. There's an identity with that. So rather than just you and Jesus in a corner or closet somewhere, whether you're praying by yourself or with others, you're affirming what the church you're praying with the church. Scott McKnight wrote a book about this, uh, I think, called Praying with the Church, where he's referring to, by entering in these prayers, we're joining our voices with the rest of Christianity. So I like that because it gives us some structure. I find that most people, especially when it comes to like trying to have a quiet time and, and practicing some of these spiritual disciplines— we don't do enough concrete teaching in the church of really just walking— I mean— by its very nature. I mean, it's individualistic. It's most of the time the instruction we get is just go get away with God for an hour. And and, 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 and then you sit in a corner right. and you're like, okay, now what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you're trying to like stay awake or, you know, I mean, there are some good helps and some good guides out there. I don't want to act like there's nothing, but um, that's one of the things that I'm really appreciate about, you know, uh, daily office, for instance, is it gives you a very firm structure yeah, and and, it, it, and a clear path forward, and so yeah, I mean, there, all of those things where you get to stand with others and community, and like I, I love that too. But it's 
if nothing else, it just simply tells you what to do. <laughs> and so you yeah. can begin to, to practice and, and affirm and, and get better. And, and so, yeah, I love that aspect. So I think we've got somebody firmly convinced they need to visit a liturgical church and try this out and see what it's all about. But they're probably like me. They feel a little nervous. They're going to a new church. You know, I don't like to go to a new church and have to greet somebody at the front door because I'm an introvert. And it's like, I just want to come in see what's going on. But what, what would your advice be? How would you encourage someone who wanted to visit an Anglican church or a liturgical church of any kind, but who felt intimidated because they didn't know what to do, like standing and sitting, and they didn't know the, the creeds by heart? What would your yeah. advice to them be? Yeah, I actually, in page 103 of the book, I've got a thing called Entering a Liturgical Church for the First Time. And I kind of give like a page and a half of like, kind of what to expect, like, all right, this is why people kneel here, this is, you know, and there's, uh, you know, there's, you know, liturgical churches are gracious, it's not like there's like a Nazi, liturgical Nazi that's going to like strike you with a, you know, if you do something wrong, it's, these are things, these are words, it's a, it's an embodied expression of worship, so oftentimes, you know, you'll have a bulletin or a prayer book or a lot of churches actually have the prayers on the screens and and it will say pray here so there should be guides that guide you through the service you know there's kind of a posture that you know oftentimes you know if it's a time to pray people will kneel or sit people will stand to worship and praise um and and, and so it's you just you know just fumble your way around that's that's what i did <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, yeah. you know, my first service, I had a little old lady hand me a prayer book and, you know, she kind of helped me through that. <laughs> but, but a lot of these churches are, it's interesting. A lot of these churches are young and, you know, I would say you'll feel at home. You know, a lot of new church plants that are doing liturgy, trying to do it. Um, there's a real sense of the hospitality to a lot of these churches. I was welcomed in. I visited probably more than a dozen of these churches across the U.S., and a lot of them were filled with young people, you know, and um, real, a lot of them have a real gracious sense of hospitality. Liturgical worship services are finding a place more and more outside of Catholic or Episcopalian churches today. There are even Pentecostal churches that are adopting liturgical practices. And these kinds of services appeal to a generation looking for structure and a connection to the church throughout history. And it provides a sense of belonging to something bigger than what we see around us. If you're becoming more curious about bringing liturgy into your daily growth practices, I want to challenge you to visit a more liturgical church service. You don't have to abandon your current church or anything. Just go for a visit. It can be a great way to learn what other members of the body of Christ are doing to become more like Him. How can you create a lifestyle of discipleship? Most Christians think discipleship is a program or a few practices thrown in at the beginning or end of the day. But we want to help you create a lifestyle where walking with Jesus throughout the day is not only possible, but natural. And we have a tool that's going to help you do just that. It's called the Daily Growth Journal. It's a guided journal that's going to help you become secure in your identity with God and authentically walk with Him in your daily life. Growing daily in your walk with Christ is possible if you cultivate a lifestyle of discipleship. And the Daily Growth Journal will help you do just that. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Daily Growth Discipleship Podcast. To find out more about Winfield and his work, check out winfieldbevins.com. Then check out the next chapter in our conversation, where Winfield talks about some of the ways art and liturgy connect. If you want to stay up to date on everything happening at Daily Growth Discipleship, go to dailygrowthdiscipleship.com and subscribe for free. You can also subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Spotify.